We are hot. Hello, everybody. What's up? We, we're doing this. We're going to teach Rust to play Hearts of Iron 4. This channel is just literally about teaching Rust to play games. What's up with that? <laughs> like, I'm not a bad gamer. Just I've never well, played these fucking games. If we ever play Armor, you're gonna have to teach me how to play like, again, because I've fucking forgotten. Like, I hate noobs, so I will never teach you to play Armor. <laughs> 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 it's just like all of the teaching is just you just shooting me. Get better. Get what better, did, scrub. What did we learn? <laughs> That's funny. Don't, don't get shot, me, Russ. <laughs> dodge, dip, dive, duck. <laughs> if you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a bullet. <laughs> So yeah, anyway, Hearts of Iron, Not freaking... useful as a cock-flavored lollipop. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, it's gummy in the middle. <laughs> uh, uh. If, if your uh, penis is gummy in the middle, I think you need to... A blow pop. <laughs> See a doctor. <laughs> so, freaking back on track. Hearts of Iron. It is, it is different than Stellaris, obviously. Um... Because it's a historical grand strategy game. It's not 4X, it's grand strategy. So, what exactly what is the, the difference? difference? You don't know the exact difference? The difference between 4X and grand strategy is that um, 4X has the 4Xs, which don't ask me to name them all. Exploration, exploitation, uh, the, uh, the, the events, and excitement. <laughs> I, don't, <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know what they all mean. <laughs> 4X games tend to follow like a set sort of like uh, phases of a game and they tend oh, to also okay. be like um, over an extreme amount of time, right? Like Civilization is 4X. Okay. Stellaris is 4X. Because Grand it spans Strange like games, hundreds of years or hundreds of thousands of years possibly. Right. Like Hearts of Iron 4, for example, spans 12 years. It's not a long time because it's the you know the period of leading up to World War II and then the period afterwards. Um, you can keep playing after I think 1948 is the the date when it ends when it shows right. you like the score and everything. But you can keep playing. But the tech trees and the units and things are designed in that sort of period of time. Right. So there's no like um, I don't know Abrams tanks or like anything like that. Right. Right, right. Um, I'm sure, like, the, it's very moddable, so I'm sure people will do a mod that takes you all the way up to modern times, right? Like, right. it'll it'll happen, I'm sure, because everything is moddable. Um, and Grand Strategy games tend to be, like, the goal is not necessarily to conquer the entire world, although it certainly can be done. People have done it. Um, so, what we're going to do is um, I'm going to walk Russ through everything and and probably two 30-ish minute videos. I don't like we'll see how fast we can get it done. But with clarity. Right. And and Russ will hopefully be asking me questions and we'll be making this clear. So this will be sort of a thing that you can also use to teach yourself how to play. And I will go ahead and say outright that I am not an expert and um, but I have played and I have read the entire wiki and I have um, watched every stream up till now and I've played I think three pretty decently long games or more so far. I've played so. five minutes of the tutorial. <laughs> I got to I got to Ethiopia and I couldn't figure out where my front line button was. Ugh. Yeah. Noob. Yep. But, so I, we're gonna... I, but I am an expert so. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to start with the basic like what is this game? This game is World War II and the period of time around it. And so um, the way Paradox does a lot of their strategy games is they, they work differently than a lot of just sort of like Command and Conquer or even Civilization where there's a lot of politics involved and there's a lot of things. So we're looking and playing cooperatively as United Kingdom, right? Um, which is a democratic nation and the democratic nations function a little bit differently than like the German fascism or Italian fascism, or, you know, Soviet Union's uh, communism. Um, and I'll explain more about that as we go on. But Cool. Well, let's let's get this rock and rolling, man. All right, man. So we're going to start at the top and all of the crazy buttons on the top. We're going to skip some of them and then talk and, like, move down. And we're trying to go from, like, a macro to a micro level. So we'll eventually get down to, like, clicking on units and shit. Nice. 
I so, wanted to make um, a unit joke so bad, but I'm like, man, I'm better than that. <laughs> <laughs> Quickly right. across the top. So we see the uh, national unity, which is at 75% right now. Um, okay, this so that's, is that's the, a that's a combination, right? So we got base sixty percent, and then King George the fifth, right? Plus fifteen percent. And if we click over on Paris and click on, um, or yeah, click on Paris, click on their little flag, uh, they have a national unity of thirty percent. It's extremely low, and this national unity is to sort of show, like, um, how structured your government is, how much right. the people sort of like like the government. And what it basically is, is it does a number that changes every now and then, but not very much. Right. And it's the percentage of the victory points that the enemy has to conquer before you will automatically surrender. Okay, so it's easy to conquer France. Yes, because uh, like be, unless they change their government and do things to make it easier. And like Germany has like 90%, right? Right. Um, and ours will probably change as we played the game. It would go up or go down depending on events and things that happen. And so, like, um, I, there's not a way to tell your entire victory points, like how many total you have. But, like, London is worth 50. Birmingham is worth 25. Um, you can see them on the map. Okay. Um, like, the, 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 the circle, or the, excuse me, the star is our capital. Obviously, it's London, right? Right. Birmingham is a is a major victory point location. It's twenty five and it's a circle, and then like Dover is also one too. But like uh, Sussex, um, Portsmouth, is a little little tiny little square because it's only worth fifteen, right? And okay. then if we scroll around, like That's... Yorkshire up in the north is worth fifteen as well, and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, it's mostly the cities, right? Like the, right. the, the the cities and the port places, you can kind of see on the map. Like London is obviously industrial and a city, and it's important. What that means is that like the little provinces around London aren't actually worth anything, right? Okay. Like if you click directly north of London, where that one unit is standing, uh -huh. is um is a province that's not worth any points. It's it might be important to take it so you can attack London. But it's not going to get you any closer to actually conquering the British necessarily, right? Okay, so that's but, East Ang Anglia. Um, I'll explain. East Anglia is actually the state. Okay, uh, but that province alone is not worth any points. Um, the the province in is East Anglia that is worth points is Norwich, and it's worth five points. Right. Um, yeah. So that's that. The second thing you see up there is um, political power. And this will change, like it's a sort of thing that just sort of ticks up. There's uh -huh. certain events and things that can give you a base, like boom, you know, increase in it. And you will be spending it a lot. It's used for like improving your relationship with other nations or doing diplomatic things. And it's also used for editing your government and stuff, which I will get to, right? Okay. Next is so manpower. Is, so is political, political power is like a currency then? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And it's just to represent, like, so America actually doesn't start getting any political power for a while because essentially it's to represent that they're spending all of their sort of political clout to handle the Great Depression, right? Okay. So until they do certain things and go through certain events, they won't be getting political power, which means they don't really have the option to sort of change their government. And you mean, whereas the U Germany. You, you mean the US, not just America, right? Right, the United States, not okay. like not like Mexico or anything like that, because the United States is currently like reeling from the Great Depression, so like there are things in the game to sort of represent that. I'm I'm zooming in Texas to see if I can see my grandma. <laughs> Where? <laughs> she's she doesn't look like she's there. Dallas okay. is only worth ten victory points. That's <laughs> bullshit. <laughs> uh, okay, so um, sorry, sorry. Yeah, and so like Germany. Um, Hitler gives Germany extra political power, so they have more freedom with like uh, declaring wars and body, you know, changing their government and things like that. Where do you right? see? Okay, there's the political power gain. So is it a dictator that does it, or is it actually Adolf Hitler that does it? It's it's Hitler himself has like a charismatic bonus or something oh, okay. that does it. Um, 
and it changes by I think everyone is base two per day. There are things you can do to make it raise or lower the amount amount, amount you get per day. Right. Um, so manpower, if you mouse over manpower, you can see that like it right. gives you the breakdown of like you've got this much, you know, thirty one thousand in our uh, air force, blah 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 blah. This is the percent of men who are currently conscripted and awaiting training, right? Or being okay. put back into your army. So as you see, we've already invested 259,000 into the units that we have available on the map, right? right? So that number shown there is the free manpower. It will go down as we take casualties. It will go down as we um, like raise new units and you know send ships out and things right. like that. And it's currently the 1.1% uh, of our total core population, which is 45 million. Okay. Right? Um, that's because of our conscription laws. It's also because J Britain has a modifier where less people conscript because the, the Great War has happened, right? Right. And sort of less. And we can change this, obviously. This will change. And it does grow. So we see that the recruitable population will grow by 600 um, a month and the civilian and body, body, block, right? Right. Because people are having babies. Over time, it's going to go up, right? Awesome. Obviously, this number hitting zero is really bad because then if your units take casualties, you can't replace them, right? right. Um, next thing we see is uh, just the total number of factories we have, which I'm like, it's not super important. Uh, but we've got 14 military factories, 19 dockyards, and 34 civilian factories, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Nice. The only reason this is important to see the number is, I guess, to sort of just quickly, like, so we've got 67. Um, Germany has way more than us, basically, currently. Right. Like, we can sort of use it as a, like, uh, basis of our power. And I think there's a couple focuses and events, which you can't do until you get a certain number. Where do you see the rivals amounts? So if I click, say, on Germany, and I uh -huh. click on their little flag to go to their, like, diplomacy menu, right? Uh-huh. I click on details, and I can get their intelligence information, which you'll notice is, oh, like, okay. 18, to, 18 to 42 for the number of divisions, because we're not entirely sure. Okay, so this is, like, our educated guess as right. citizens of the UK. And, and there are technologies that can make this better or worse, right. actually. Right. So we're, they have somewhere between 18 and 42 divisions. I'm going to go ahead and make an estimate that it's on, it's like, you know, 30-ish or something maybe. Right. Germany is currently demilitarized because of the Great War, you know, World War One's treaties, but they're going to build up really fast, right? Right. So yeah, that's where you see that. <laughs> so going right to the top, we've got three little stars with numbers, the little zeros by them. Uh-huh. That's our army experience, our navy experience, and our air experience. Now, okay. this experience is different than, say, the experience your units gain on the battlefield. So, if we click on the unit to the little, like the little tank unit by London, okay, you will see that it's a regular tank unit. It's experience level three. The blank bar, um, where's the experience bar next to it? I don't see what the experience bar is, but whatever. Um. So this experience that this certain Royal Tank Regiment gains is completely separate from the Army experience up top. Okay. The experience that this division gains represents like how good the men are at fighting, how much you know experience they've had. The experience up top is a sort of abstract way to represent how much your government and your officers have learned about and engineers have learned about ways to tweak units. So, for example, we will use our Navy experience to build variants of ships and say, like, I want a ship that's got bigger guns. Right. So we take sort of the, the basic battleship we've, we've researched and we spend Navy experience to, like, tweak it in ways we want, right? Um, right. We spend air experience to do the same with planes. We spend Army experience to tweak our divisions and say, like, you know, I want to add a support company to this, you know, template or whatever right okay so then the star experience up top and i'm just calling it star experience because oh well, it's, it's not... army navy and air experience right but the group of three army navy right. that's this is like high command experience basically right and then but it is also it is also separate from a general's experience a right. general earns experience 
separately, right? So like your it's like our, it's like theoretical experience, right? Right, right. So Think. our individual units will gain their own experience as they fight, but yeah. our military high command basically will gain experience as well, and it's used in a different capacity. So it's right. both they're, they're both experienced, they're just different types. Yes. Of experience. Okay. Think of the, think of this experience as like a currency experience because you okay. expend it and it, it goes away, right? Right. Okay. Cool. Um, so like you know, making a making a submarine variant is going to cost us a certain amount of navy experience, but then we'll get a submarine variant that we could build to be like super fucking fast or something, right? right. We could we so you can sort of um, specialize things more as you gain this experience, right? Right. Um, to the right of that is just the amount of convoys we have. Um, these are you. These are sort of um, they're ships that you don't command uh, directly, but like if we wanted to trade with the, with America and say buy a bunch of their oil, right? Right. We would need a certain amount of convoys, and they would then appear on the map and go back and forth. Okay. And people can like shoot. You know, you can blow them up with submarines and stuff. So, and if we run out of convoys, then we can't trade with with people across the ocean, right? right. We have no ships that are just convoy ships. They're also used for, like, if I want to transfer troops over to um, Ireland, I have to use convoys to do it because there's no strait between um, Britain and our provinces in Ireland, right? Right. 800 is a shit ton. <laughs> like, and we'll get to how they're produced later. But okay. Moving on. Um, we've just got the army bar button over there underneath the time um the navy button and the air button it just shows us like our total uh forces everywhere for a nation as big as britain these buttons are really kind of useless right like if you click on the navy button holy shit we've got a ton of navy right right you can sort of sort them so i can say like area and i can see that like i've got a submarine flotilla and a mediterranean fleet stationed in egypt right right and you can select them from here. So if I wanted to, I could select the Mediterranean fleet and give it orders. But I'm, we're not going to worry about that right now. Okay. So then the little globe over there. This is the world tension meter. And it will raise from 0% where it uh -huh. is currently to 100%. And it will, like, burn the world as it goes. It's kind of cool. If you click on it, you can see, like, what current wars there are. Which is the only current war in the world is Italian versus Italy versus Ethiopia, right? Italy has currently declared war in Ethiopia, and they're in the midst of invading it, basically. Freaking eye ties, man. Yeah. Um, and so you can see, like, which country has raised the most world tension and body, body, blah. Okay. What world tension does, and this is important, so let's leave the world tension thing and click over on the United Kingdom flag, and we'll discuss this in just a second. Okay. Democratic nations. Um, where is Democratic? Right, so if you mouse over the world word democratic underneath Neville Chamberlain's uh -huh. majestic mustache, we <laughs> can't do certain things until the world tension is high enough. Oh, okay. Like, we can't just go ahead and declare war on Ireland right now. There's, like, it, because we're a democratic nation, it's it. there's no legal recourse for doing that. Right. But, right? So, like, at... Eh, where's... I don't know where the numbers are. But, like... At around 25% world tension, we can start guaranteeing other countries and saying, like, don't worry, Switzerland. We guarantee your independence because clearly, you know, Germany is going crazy or whatever, right. right? We can't also, like, send volunteers to other nations or, like, give lend lease to other nations until world tension has hit a certain amount. So... The democratic nations, and the, way, the reason they do this is because, um, with the exception of Soviet Russia, although Soviet Russia has its own problems, um, if United Kingdom were to declare war on Germany right now, we would win. Very easily, right? right. So this is their way of making, like, um, so especially in multiplayer, um, the, the fascist and the communist, they get a little bit amount of time to take a little bit of land and to do some small wars and stuff to build up their power right right like united states has it even worse like their hands are essentially completely tied because they're like extremely isolationist right they so can't do like anything until like the world tension hits like 75 percent right and that's exactly like, that's true to history 
Right. So it's and it's also because the United States is a fucking powerhouse, and if they were to declare war on pretty much anyone right now, they would probably win. USA. So they can't just go ahead. Yeah, USA. <laughs> right. So United States, obvi- like, also can't just go ahead and just crush Canada. Sorry, right. Canada. <laughs> At this point in time, you would lose, right? Like, <laughs> so it's an interesting mechanic because if you're playing one of those fascist nations or a communist nation, you want to see like how much can I squeak out, right? Before things are really going to start, like people are going to start taking notice of what I'm doing and right. everything, right? right? Okay, so let's stay on the politics screen and let's talk about that. Okay. So we can see who's leading our country in Neville Chamberlain. It's not really important unless they have like special sort of things. Then we can see our national spirit. Um, since we're playing as one of the major nations, a lot of the minor nations don't even have any of these, except Sweden does because Paradox is a Swedish company, and so <laughs> they gave themselves they gave themselves a special like little thing. Um, and these are things to represent, like we've got King George, right? And he he is a popular figurehead. He raises right. our national unit. People like him, right? We're also British uh, Stoicism, it's, and that means that it would be very hard. So like if Germany wanted to spend their political power to influence fascist fascism in our country, uh-huh. it's not, not going to do much, right? We're, we're the British, and we're going to stay British, and we're going to stay de- uh, a democracy, right. right? We have a 50% defense, basically, against anyone trying to influence our sort of politics. And we also have like our recruitable, recruitable population is at negative twenty five percent for now because we we don't want to go to war basically. Right. And these national spirits can change. Um, you can add certain ones. Right. These will these will change over time as the nation changes. Like I I'm, I haven't played as Britain, but I'm sure we will lose that war to end all war um, focus eventually or spirit right. thing eventually. Right. Right. Um, then we can see our like we are in the. Um, allies faction in fact the united kingdom is the leader of the allies faction um and it includes canada australia new zealand south america and the british south africa excuse me and the british raj um we can since we're the leader um in in order to completely beat the allies like we have to be completely conquered right um then we're democratic our next election blah blah blah. we can see the different parties so um the Communist Party is only a 1% popularity. The Fascist Party is 2%, right? The Conservative right. Democratic Party is at 97%, and it's probably not going to ever lose, basically, right? Below that, we've got laws and government. So these are things you spend your political power on. So if you click on volunteer only, we can see that if we wanted to switch to limited conscription, it would cost us 150 political power, which okay. we don't have right now, right? But that would raise the amount of population we can recruit. So it would raise our manpower, right? We can change our export focus, which I'll talk more about later. We can change our economy. And we can also add advisors. So like if you click on the first political advisor slot, you can see that we could add like a quartermaster general who would, um, it would cost us political power, but he would be there permanently. Right. And we would get a permanent increase to the way things, like the speeds of certain things, right? Right. So we could, you know, uh, we could we could add a fascist demagogue, and he would start raising fascist support. But since we're the British and we got that defense, it's not going to be as effective. Right. right? You wish this your is life, the way, John Beckett. <laughs> yeah. So like, if you're playing as Greece, like I did a while ago, uh-huh. and I wanted to become communist, I like the first thing I did as soon as I got that political power was get a communist supporter, so they would start moving me towards communism. Right. Right. And below that, we've got like a tank designer, so we can have the Vickers Armstrong tank designer. Nice. Um, since we're a major nation, we've got like uh, historical ones. Like I'm sure America has Ford and things like that. Right. Like Japan has Mitsubishi. Mitsubishi. Ugh. Mitsubishi. And like yeah, and the Germany has like Mer- um, Mercedes and BMW, I think, right? Because these were historical companies that like did things. Here, um, okay. And if you click on this. Sorry, yes. Ask me questions. So, here's my question. This is, doesn't even pertain to the game. But if you were to make like a new version of this, would you consider selling advertising to these companies to be in your game? Do you think that's a viable option? Oh my god. That's, that's so beyond the scope of what we're talking about. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, but that's, that is interesting. I mean, it would be... Um, 
first of all, would you want your company involved in a video game that you don't really have control over? Is it going to be good for your company or not? But it's a viable option, I think. <laughs> anyway, please continue. Okay, so how are we on time, by the way? We're about seven minutes out. So we can, so finish, we can finish the screen, and then we'll probably can call it episode one. Yeah. So, I mean, as you see, like, these are all things, and, like, some of them give you more choices, right? So if we wanted to look at, like, our material designer, we have a choice between Vauxhall, RSAF, Enfield, and the Royal Arsenal, right? Right. And we can only have one material designer. We can switch it later if we want to, but, like, we'll have to look and see, like, well, what do I want? Do I want faster artillery research? Do I want faster small arms research? Do I want faster motorization research, right? These things are... Um, important decisions we have to make and, and spend right. our power. And then the military staff below is like chief of army, chief of navy, and these also, so we can pick like a, a maneuver genius, right? Alan Brooke, a, a historical figure in Britain. Right. And, he, and he'll give us a bigger bonus than if he was just an expert, right? He gives us a 15% compared to a 10%. Right. And it's to speed, not attack, right? Right. And so on and so forth, right? We have all these. So... For the chiefs, the chiefs, we only have one choice, like a choice between one. We can only select one. The military high command, we get this big pool, and we can select three of them eventually, right? Okay. So, like, if we want, like, a, you know, a logistics expert, an infantry expert, and an amphibious assault expert on our sort of military staff, we can have that. We can have all three of them. Right. But, but these slots, once filled, are, again, you can change them, but, like, you don't get any, as far as I know... You don't get any more of these slots ever. Okay. Um, below that, we've got the manage occupied territories, which if we wanted to, we could give Ireland back um, Northern Ireland, right? No way. Or we could give Hong Kong. Yeah, we give Hong Kong back to Canada, to China, excuse me, or we could give Newfoundland back to Canada if we wanted to. Which so this will become more, even more important as we start to like occupy land, right? And uh, have to deal with like um, rebels and things like that. It's also cool because if I wanted to, I could release Egypt as a nation, and then I could play as them. I think. Right. Like right. So I so you can sort of immediately change how history worked with just this thing. Right. So to finish up this video, let's talk about national focuses. So if you click on the national focus button, all right, you'll Holy see. Moly. Yeah, essentially a giant tech tree. And now this is bigger because we're playing as a. Um. The the sort of major nations. Um which is Germany, Britain, France, uh, United States, Soviet Union, Japan, Italy, and Poland, actually, um, because they made, they made the free LC for Poland um, did this. They all have unique ones, and then there's a generic one that is for any other nation, and they're going to add more later. Like right. they've, I'm, I'm sure we'll do a Swedish one, right? So and this is a... a What's the, it's like, okay, I understand. What's the overall idea behind this? This there is what? Two, there are two ideas, and, and, and one of them is kind of um, meta in a way, and one of them is basically, so the first thing that this thing is, is this is your government tech tree, basically. Okay. And it gives you certain choices. You can only ever work on one of these at a time. It costs you one of your political power per day as you work on it. Okay. Right? So, um, and you can't change it once you've selected it. Okay. So if we look at, like, limited rearmament, we see that what it's going to do once we're done with it is it's going to give us free factories. Okay. Um, and so this is to represent, like, the government sort of taking a hand in, like, you know, we want to focus on building some factories here and so on and so forth so we like issue tax um, rebates to business owners yeah or whatever and so we can also see over there like if you scroll to the uh, right there's one that's like reinforce the empire gives us more national unity right right which we don't need because we got british stoicism right uh british stoicism only affects the ideological defense now it doesn't affect national unity at all. Oh, okay um, and if we keep scrolling over, we can see that we've got like home defense, which will add some coastal forts and, and so on and so forth. So some of them do things like here's have a bunch of political power or have some free, uh, you know, factories or um, get an extra research slot. Right. Okay. 
Some of them also do things like give you some navy experience or some army experience. Um, some of them do things like give you uh, research um, benefits where you can like research things faster, right? Okay. Some of them do things like, for example, all the way on the far right, secure Belgium. Uh -huh. That gives us a, a war, like a we um, uh, we get a legal war recourse against Belgium to make them our puppet. So, and, but I can we can only do it if Belgium is starting to swing communism or fascism, right? Okay. So there are political things in here too, right? Like right. we can em embargo so, Germany, or we can go to war with Germany, or and so, so on. So it's and not so forth. just it's not just our choices that allow us to to pick this stuff. It also has to be like the prerequisites right. go beyond our choices for these things. And like, some of them, yeah, yeah, yeah. So like sometimes they're locked out, right? Right. Um, some of them are mutually exclusive. For example, we can't coerce Spain and also fortify Gibraltar. We got to pick one of those, right? right? Um, some of them will a uh, where's the one that does maybe it's a, maybe it's in the French tree, but there is some of them will like give a suggestion to another player or to the AI, right? So like um, Soviet Union has one where they sort of pressure Finland, and then if the Finland player was playing, they would get an event after the Soviet Union was done with their focus. Uh -huh. the, the the Finnish person would get an event and be like, okay. It's either war or I give him these territories, right? Right. And I think France has one where if they do it, then Britain gets an event where essentially France and Britain become in a, the same com uh, country. So they're Ooh. they're really cool because they can do all kinds of crazy things. Um, right. And and they're also like really hard to pick because you can only do one at a time, and it takes seventy days for most of them, right. which is a short amount of time. But some of the the more like major ones take a little bit more time. And again, you've got to like, you got to like, you know, I can't just get, um, you have to follow the tech tree kind right. of idea, right? Um, so they're cool and they allow you to do sort of non historical things, right? Right. And the other thing that they're here for is so when you start a new game, you can select historical focus or not historical focus, uh -huh. right? So if you select historical focus and say we were like, um, I think we can actually look at Germany's. If we go to Germany and go to their national focus, yeah, we can see their tree. So can you go to their tree and look at it? Yeah, I'm trying to. Let's see. State owner flag, national focus. Okay. Yeah. So if you play with historical focuses on, then German, the German AI player is not going to pick Befran China. They're gonna pick Befran Japan, right? Where's this at? Uh, to the right, a little bit underneath Rhineland. Okay. And they're not going to pick like uh, I'm trying to find one of the other ones. Befran Denmark. It's it's way far down. So it's okay if you can't see it because historically, Germany did not befriend Denmark. They invaded Denmark, right? Dude, spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, if you play with national, if you play with historical focuses on the AI, chooses things in the uh, the correct order and what the like historically what they did. Okay. So that if you play with historical focuses on, ninety nine percent of the time, uh, Germany is going to invade Poland in nineteen thirty nine. Right. Right. Now, if you don't play with historical focuses on, they sort of just choose based on other weighted, you know, sort of AI things. So they still might declare war on Poland. It just might happen earlier or it might happen later. Like, right. You don't know exactly. Right. Or they might do weird, crazy things, right? Like, um, I think I've seen a, a stream where Finland actually just sort of capitulated automatically to the Soviet Union and became part of the Soviet Union instantly and never, the, the Winter War never happened, basically. But historically, when Finland gets that event, they say go fuck yourself Soviet Union and there's the Winter War like right. in 38 or whatever right so it's cool because um, it's a really cool way for modders to actually um, influence the AI decisions as they change certain things right because you can put a weight you can put a weight when you, if you make a new focus tree and stuff like that and it's a good way for players to sort of be like you know if you play with historical focuses on you know like war is going to happen in 1939 right right 
But at the same time, I've seen um, Republican Spain win the um, Spanish Civil War and the the, na- the fascists lose, right? Right. Like, things can still sort of tip either way depending on what happens. And obviously, if there's when if there's a human player involved, things are going to tip even more, right. right? Awesome. Well, yeah. Let's 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 call my, that video. Uh, and then... Yeah. Look, to recap, so. My mind's blown once again. There's a lot to wrap your head around. So, like, I got... We covered the top... We skipped, the, we skipped some of those buttons, but we, we covered sort of, like, the numbers up top, right? right? And the, the world tension, which is really important, and I don't quite understand all the ins and outs yet. Um, right. But it's important, especially for democratic nations and, you know, even fascist nations and stuff like that. Because right. Because you got to keep your eye on it and know, like... If I declare this war, that means that, you know, Great Britain's going to start, decla- like, advocating for the, or guaranteeing the independence of certain nations, right? So, like, maybe I should wait a couple years for it to drop back down, right? Right. Awesome. Well, cool, cool. um, great video, great introduction. We'll continue it um, next time from Tessa Borley. My name's Russ. I'm... Russ the noob and David the mediocre. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you guys next time. I don't know shit about history, so we're like... gonna get, we're gonna start getting to the micro level next time. So awesome! All right, we'll um see you next time. Peace. Later, dudes.